Uh, the energy we use in electronic music, and if there's a way to, you know, as performers, we produce all this energy when we're performing, and if that's somehow a way <coughs> to use it in powering the electronics, um, and also how that would affect the expression and the practice of it. And um, it's sort of a very um, controversial topic in a way. He presented it at nine in Paris, and there was sort of a, a very strong reaction. People were almost upset about it, because in a way, it does kind of question your whole practice as a laptop musician or a computer musician. It's also a very difficult topic, just because it could easily expand to much larger issues. And to try to keep it focused on just music or art is a very difficult task. So um, I took a very um, irresponsible move to hand this topic to Jamie Allen, uh, who is a very close friend, but also a very amazing uh, artist, musician, researcher, and teacher, who does deal with these uh, themes. And um, I asked him to sort of host this, um, this session today. So I'll pass it on to you, Jamie. Thank you. You're good at introductions. <laughs> I practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess just to echo a little bit of what Taku was saying there, it's really very special and right to have the opportunity to present some of these ideas here. Um, Michelle and I had the opportunity that same year, actually. We, we both, I think, independently been thinking about these ideas a little bit. I, I, at the time, was working in a lot of interactive design contexts as a kind of consulting engineer for sustainable design projects. and and had some similar ideas in this direction. And when Michelle spoke about them, I was kind of like, we have to talk. And I came back to Stein, and we had a, a you know, half hour to sit down and just discuss some of the technicalities of what this might entail, i.e. this idea of taking both the metaphor and the literal energy uh, of a performer and trying to translate it somehow to either something that, again, literally drives uh, electronic music, but is it even electronic music anymore, you know, if you're not plugging in? Um, and then also just uh, other motivations around this thing. So uh, this is what we're going to do today uh, for the next couple of hours anyway. Um, I'll talk, I'm just going to give a little bit of that background essentially, like what, what some of the interesting motivations for this, uh, I think, rather new idea in this community uh, are. Um, then we'll talk to a few other people <coughs> who have been invited um, to discuss the idea, uh, and then we'll hopefully have a bit of a discussion around um, Again, I'm hoping some of the things that Taku said might spark a bit of debate, like you know, how relevant is this to your practice, <coughs> if at all? Um, does, it feel, does it feel like blatant bandwagoning? Do we want to you know, throw it out the window um, or not? So here's what we're not talking about. And this is uh, my inspiration from a colleague yesterday to be a little more categorical um, in the way that I think. So what we're not talking about is an email that I got yesterday. This says, uh, the Sundance Channel documentary series, The Lazy Environmentalist, proves that going green can be effective, beautiful, and affordable. Um, host Josh Dorman visits with professionals from all walks of life. This is a call, essentially, that there's a really obnoxious list I'm on, which I won't give the name of, um, that, that talks a lot about uh, sustainability issues in a, in a real showbiz way, right? And, and most of the projects that they kind of espouse and, and their calls in it for are these things that give examples of why this is a good idea, usually in ways that use more energy than the thing that they're exposing themselves, right? So a big LCD screen that has a visualization of how much energy you're using per year, but the screen itself is driving, you know, 250 watts. Uh, um, so this idea of visualization as a kind of solution or maybe as a, a way of uh, talking about awareness is something that I think we're kind of over, right? I mean, I'm aware, you're aware. We all know that the problems, I just think we need to move into the world of putting brain power towards solving them, or at least antagonizing them in a different way. That isn't just about <coughs> look, 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 right? It's about do, 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 do. Um, so what we are talking about is uh, issues of the performer and the body, uh, the relationship between context, <coughs> i.e. performing context, artistic context, and environment, um, how technology and even information are kind of a resource, right? And so. Um, and how, how individuals and communities kind of interrelate. And so I think of this in a way uh, as, a, as an area called sort of like creative ecologies, right? Um, and it has some motivations, uh, some of which uh, I'll talk about now. Um, one of them I think probably relates a little bit to sort of acoustic ecology movements and stuff like that. Uh, 
it seems fairly natural to me that sound and sort of sonic arts and music have a relationship to the environmental world in a different way than a lot of other forms. There's a sense in which, you know, the way that you experience sound is very much an individual experience, but at the same time, it's what tells you most about the spaces you're in. And so in that sense, it sort of has an inherent dialogue, I think, with sort of the environment, if you will. Another way to look at this as a motivation is that our relationship to technology tend to be framed up, especially in the new media world, right, in basically two ways. You're either antagonizing the existence of it, right, because you think the world is becoming more or too much technological, or you're kind of looking at how the kind of folk, the folk sensibility, right, where you say, well, we should be using technology in art because it's in everything else that we do, right? Well, there's kind of a third way of looking at that, which is the McClellan, I'm Canadian, right, so this stuff gets pumped into us when we're babies. The media theorist, Mark McClellan, said a lot about how the tools that we make, and in a sense, what I'm trying to point to here is the energy that we make or the energy that we choose to route in certain ways is really just part of us. It's not a dualism anymore. It might actually be something that we can think of as part of a kind of, again, an overall ecosystem of which we're part, as opposed to, you know, an antagonism and or a kind of folk sensibility. The performance energy metaphor, right, this is maybe, so those two things that I just mentioned are probably a little more heady and conceptual, and I'll try to head more direct now. The idea of performance energy is something that we just say, you know, and it goes beyond, I think, a linguistic sensibility of thinking, you know, that someone has a certain energy on stage. I think there is a literal energy on stage, and we were just, we had a conversation this morning about, you know, just seeing a, I hope I'm not stealing your story. No, no, uh, a Messian piece uh, last night, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a way in which the pianist, who you had a conversation with, um, you know, at the halftime or whatever, uh, is just physically kind of tired, right? There's, 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 there's energy that he put into that performance that, that he or she is not getting back. <coughs> so that is a literal repercussion of the performance. Um, and one, I think, that can, can be kind of looked at uh, in this context. So I just, I, just for fun. Look at the show a bit. What I'm saying is what, what made Michelle such a kind of uh, amazing electronic music performer was the sense of energy that he had on stage and the sense of sort of exertion, if you will. Um, another motivation, uh, the operator, right? Um, this, I, I'm really interested in this as an idea in general in that, in that you, if you think about plugging in your computer and you think about plugging in a circuit and you think about plugging in something that makes noise, Really, all you're doing as an artist is taking that energy and routing it in a certain way, right? You can think about that in software, you can think about that in hardware, but no matter what, you're always just taking a signal, which you know initially is sort of the 60 hertz or 50 hertz uh, AC, and turning it into something that then comes out of a speaker. And so that is a, as a long process. Um, you know, it also happens to be true in terms of the sustainability movement that, that we tend to use more energy just in making energy than anything else, right? It takes a lot more energy to turn coal into electricity than it does to turn, you know, electricity into a light bulb or into a light. Um, and so this is something that I think you can start to think of as a way that your artistic information or the information that you're giving to an audience or the information you're giving to um, any art context is really just energy routed in some way. Um, so that's an interest. 
reinventing self reliance. This is the major global global trade routes. Um, I just thought it was a good way of exposing. I think there's a certain movement towards uh, local community um, in terms of information, which I think Brian will talk a little bit about, um, and resources themselves, right? That we see this kind of thing through, and I don't mean local geographically, right? I mean local in terms of these information communities and artistic communities. We see these kinds of things in, I think, Instructables, right? Which is a site where you can learn how to do anything. Um, and other material kind of recycling initiatives and, and ways of getting the, the things you make art with have become far more, far more self-reliant, I think, over the last few years. Um, a related issue, uh, what are we plugging into, right? You plug into the wall every time you go perform, we plug in the PA every time we go and set up a show. <coughs> this is coal, <laughs> and that's a speaker. So at the end of the day, again, in a way, you're always just doing this. That happens to be the uh, amount of coal it takes to drive a light bulb for 24 hours. Um, exclusionary technological domains is the last sort of motivation I'll talk about. The idea here really is, is that there's certain, I, I have a picture of uh, victimless leather, which is a uh, Katz and Zur piece where they tried to create biologically a piece of leather that had absolutely no ethical implications. So it was completely synthetic leather, right? It was chrome. Um, and then next to that is Field by Richard Box, which is a piece where he puts fluorescent lights in a grid beneath really high power lines and they just light up because of the EMF in the area. And these two things to me seem like two different areas where um, kind of traditionally and, and I think institutionally and certainly because of the scale and the nature of these kinds of sciences and technological domains, we're not, we're not allowed, right? There's a lot of cutoffs, there's a lot of sort of fences around these particular areas. And I think power electronics, honestly, is one of those. You know, we've grown up thinking of utility as something that just kind of comes out of the wall and is not something that we have any real jurisdiction in artistically. Um, and whether or not that's a motivation, I mean, I happen to think it is. Anything I'm not allowed to do, I tend to want to do. But uh, it's certainly, a, I think, a fact anyway. So that was my introduction to the topic. Any questions? Um, I think we're going to hear from Ben. So Ben Knapp, sitting to my left, is a senior lecturer at uh, Queens Belfast in the, is it music, sound, sound art, sound, music and sound art? Music. Sonic Arts Research Center. Sonic Arts Research Center is, is the center you're in. Um, and he's got a lot of interest in, he built the Biomuse system that we saw the other day, uh, the original one anyway, the one that a Tao plays, Tao Tanaka. Um, as well as still being involved in that kind of work and has some interest in interaction design and you know its implications in art as well as other fields. So let's welcome Ben. Okay. We have to. Oh yeah. Actually, th yeah, thanks, Jamie. And, and I think that, um, you know, taking a little bit from what Jamie said, and this is very, very impromptu, and I, I really hope um, more than, you know, there was, there's a discussion that started ha um, happening certainly between Jamie and I, and I think Jamie and, and Brian, I don't, we haven't had a chance to yeah. talk, but I really hope that we can get a discussion going, because um, I think that, um, certainly speaking for me, this this focus on energy is, is something I really... I guess I was almost going to say I hadn't thought about, but I, I back in the um, in the 80s when we first started this, and there was um, the the strange movements in the, um, south of market in, in San Francisco. We, we were talking a little bit about energy and, and the body back then, but then it sort of faded into the underground. And so it's kind of interesting to bring this discussion um, back to the fore again and um, and elaborate on it. And really, um, oh, we don't, we don't have do you actually need vision. to see the? Um, Oh, I can. I can. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that. Um, action. Action. Computer. Computer. 
Well, let's try one more. There. Um, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do this. We're having a little bit of energy problem coming out to VGA. Um, but Jamie had introduced uh, almost two ways of looking at energy. Um, one is about supplying power, and one is about supplying communication. And maybe, in fact, they're the same thing. Um, the body has a way of converting coal into energy and then using that conversion of coal into energy to drive communication. And so that's kind of the way, um, this is pretty interesting, I'm going to have a crick in my neck by the end. Um, but uh, th th this is the way I'm looking at the body as well. And I'm going to be specifically very um, me-centric, and what I mean by that is body-centric. Um, and uh, looking at the body as the power source, um, and what can we do with that, and then the body as the um, communication source. So we've now got the power and... Um, how do we use uh, energy to communicate and how, how can that be uh, used artistically and measured? Um, and I think you're going to actually have some of these pictures, at least the rumor was so. Um, or maybe not. Uh, anyway. Okay. <laughs> so in the body predominantly, um, we can harvest energy, and this is what it's called these days, is energy harvesting from the body. Can we, and the, the purpose again would be, can we take you off the grid or um, if you're wearing um, uh, body-worn sensors or if you're using some sort of um, uh, instrument or human-computer interaction device, can, you know, is there some way of powering that to, from all of this food and the, uh, and the body itself? And there is certainly, and the, the most obvious is power from motion. You use a, um, a lot of this energy to just uh, move you around. And we can harvest that from the, your foot motion itself, either kinematic or pressure. Um, and that, again, each one of these is a way to get energy to drive this communication we're going to talk about in a bit. But it's also in itself, and there's a piece that I'm going to talk about right at the end, um, where I used this not for um, just harvesting energy, but actually as a communication. Um, you can think of Foley, for example. You know, here's an interesting thing to know when you're walking along and, uh, and moving. So, yes, we can actually harvest power and get power from your, your walking, but we can also use that. Um, at, in a creative way as well. So we can power our creation and we can use it as a creative method. And in kinematic, you can uh, um, attach these things to any joint you want um, and power things. And then finally, the last picture on the right is actually um, of uh, fabric that's being used now to harvest energy from the body, um, both in the elasticity as you breathe in um, and breathe out, using that energy to drive things. Um, it also can measure vibration throughout the body. One of the things that Jamie and I were talking about is, um, gee, this is old stuff. I had a, um, a watch that was given to me in the 1970s, and that was it, these watches have been around, I think, since the 1800s, where they had little self-winding watches that use kinematic energy to drive the, um, your watch. And they're fantastic. You never wound them, never needed the little lithium battery inside, you never needed to do anything. This is the... 2000s version of that to get um, the more power because we need more power to drive more things. Uh, but they, these polymers and they, these fabrics are quite interesting because again, you can actually drive the electronics, you can drive the interface, but you can also use them in a, in a creative way um, as well. And certainly a lot of clothing now is, is part of um, uh, musical interaction and um, sonic arts interfacing. That's on the macro scale and um, for those that are not squeamish, um, you can actually get power in, at the micro scale. Um, you can actually use your blood flow um, to drive circuits. And so a lot of nano circuits that are um, going to be used to measure things in the body. And I'm not sure the artistic implications there. Uh, but, um, but certainly there's a science art edge there somewhere. Um, blood flow, temperature gradient. This is actually temperature gradient is a, is a wonderful source of power. You just throw away, as you all know, a ton of heat um, all the time, and so this temperature gradient is a really nice uh, source of power, but it also tells you, again, something about you, something about your state. So your body temperature is one of the leading indicators of your emotional state, um, also your physical activity, but your emotional state is told a lot by your, the temperature that you're creating. So you're creating power to drive interfaces, it's the coal, but it's also that communication mechanism, and again, as Jamie was saying, they're sort of inextricable uh, at the edge. And then biochemical interactions that happen with the body, and we're going to go um, go quite further in that direction. 
So those, these are the ways to um, use motion in the body to generate power. Um, and then, holy cow, look at that. Um, I just found this web page a few days ago, and I just thought this was brilliant and unreadable. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so you have to always put one unreadable slide up every time just to um, show the level of, of people working on this. This is an extremely active field right now, and the reason being um, that ambient sensing um, and ambulatory sensing, sensing in the environment and sensing on the body now are becoming, as the word ubiquitous is becoming ubiquitous. And um, this ubiquitous computing is in fact uh, what's driving all of this. So whereas if we had this conversation in the 1980s, um, it would be this, oh gee, we need to um, look at energy from the body, but, but geez, we can't do it. And in fact, nowadays, you've got kinematic temperature, you've got all of these different um, ways um, of, and, and obviously there are environmental ambient ways, and I think we're going to have, um, well, we have a solar cell sitting here somewhere, and, and Jamie, pro I mean, not Jamie, uh, Taku promised that he was going to put up a windmill um, outside um, <laughs> shortly. Uh, but, but this is what you can get from the body, and this is what's available right now um, for actually beginning to do artistic research. And, and how, how we can use, not, not just pull yourself off the grid, but also use the, this way of creating energy in an artistic way. Um, I can't talk in front of people without um, delving immediately into um, the bioelectric signals of the body. Um, it's force of habit and, and like, you can't get me out of it. Uh, but the, the, when I very first um, started working in bioelectric signals, um, way, way, way back, um, the first thing was, oh my god, you're, you're basically <coughs> taking the energy of the body and converting it to music. And in fact, that's what we do all the time when you play the piano. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're converting the energy of your body and you're converting it into music. Um, what I'm interested in is getting closer and closer to the energy source, uh, the actual electrical signals, the, the energy that's created um, directly from um, you metabolizing your food, um, your ATP, and, um, and actually creating these electrical signals and these um, ionic signals that flow through your body. And can we tap into those energy, communication energy? They're not big enough to supply energy, but they're big enough that if we use other sources of power, we can amplify these um, energy sources as a communication mechanism. This isn't new. Um, a lot of you probably are familiar with um, Alvin Lussier sitting out there in, um, in 65 with a headband on. Um, and he took a lot of energy um, to amplify the signals that were coming, electrical signals that were coming from his brain, the energy signals, and seeing um, if he could create music from that. Can he listen to the music of the energy of the brain and, and um, create something? And this is on YouTube, if those of you have it. And people, this is, yeah? Pretty, yeah, okay. Um, don't know how many people have seen this before. What about this one? Um, this one was introduced to me by Stein. Um, and it's quite fascinating. And um, uh, you know, what's funny is how many people have been actually looking at um, electrical signals from the body, energy from the body, and how long they've, they've been looking at it. So in 1978, Dick Reimacher um, actually did a piece where he was looking at the energy and exertion um, in. Um, and, and before I explain this, is everybody? Is there anybody that doesn't know this piece? Okay, there's a few people. Okay, great. Because um, it wasn't. Um, since he's native around here, I didn't know whether it was um, describing something that everybody knew. But this piece is absolutely fascinating in terms of energy because the whole piece, you have a man sitting on a bike, and in 30 minutes, he does this. That's it. I mean, in 30 pieces, 30 minutes, he takes, he's sitting on the bike, he lifts his leg up, gets over the top of the bike, and gets off. And you think, okay, that's, that's, that's trivial. Try doing it. Um, it's, by the end, he's dripping in sweat. He's pouring down sweat. He, his, every muscle in his body, talk about energy consumption. Um, I imagine he eats like four pizzas and, and a steak um, before he does this. And, and because the whole piece is about the energy that he consumes. And so what Dick Reimacher was looking at was, well, how do we listen to that? How would we listen to the amount, this energy that's being produced from the body? What can we do? And so way back in, in 78, 30 years ago, there was a 30-year, um, and actually I think um, 
uh, Edvin is still touring with this piece. Um, uh, they did a 30 year reenactment, if you will, of the piece. And um, here they're looking at the muscle, the tension, the, and I'll go through these just very quickly in a moment, um, with the tension in the arms, the electrical signal of the arm, not motion of the arm, but the electrical signal, the raw energy that's in the arm. They're looking at the um, uh, ECG, the, the heart beating, the electrical signal from the heart, um, the, the change in impedance of the skin, and also listening to the, um, the actual breathing. So all of a sudden, it was almost like listening to um, a coal plant. I mean, it was like listening to energy being created. And you could see more and more the inefficiencies that happened um, as he slowly got, just got tired and less and less efficient. Um, and it's really um, quite a remarkable piece. Um, Sorry? Yeah? What was the name of the one you saw? Um, this? <coughs> the one before that. That. Um, Music for Solo and Solo Performer. And these are just examples. I actually, um, people always send me emails, and I, I dearly love them. So anybody that knows other pieces that use this, please send me. Because I've gotten um, emails of clarinetists using EMG in the 70s and 80s. I've gotten emails of all of these people in separate, diverse areas looking at, at how we can look at um, the energy that comes from the body and how can we use that in artistic expression. And, um, and so I'm always interested in, in finding pieces. Like I said, this piece I only found out because Taku and, and, uh, and Edvin uh, told me about it. Um, and, uh, and certainly I've been um, working with um, uh, Atau on looking at um, uh, energy creation and, and specifically this piece was something that I'll, I'll um, when I finish up, I'll talk a little bit more about, but just that uh, here's a piece where he's, he, Energy to music, he's simply playing a Tibetan bowl. So he's running his hand around the Tibetan bowl and resonating it. But what he does is then he slowly lifts his hand off the bowl and continues to create the same music. So we're now we're actually just looking at the energy. Um, where the energy is not being transversed into this acoustical amplifier. Now it's being um, going through an electrical amplifier, in essence, and then using that to create the, the sound and music itself. So he can move back and forth between the two. Um, and some of the things that are ongoing now, um, looking at uh, emotion, and this is, this is what I'll be talking about much more um, in a second, um, is emotion coming from, looking at the electrical signals of the body. Can we infer um, the emotion of a conductor? Can we watch this energy of emotion move from the conductor to the audience and to the other performers and between performers? Is there really an energy that, that's going on that's being passed? And the, it sounds very, um, put it nicely, I was going to uh, metaphysical to be talking about this. Um, but in fact, in science, you can <coughs> clearly begin to see entrainment and synchronization of, ener of the energy between two people very quickly. Um, you can see everything from foot tapping starting to be entrained, but also heart rate, um, uh, the, the emotional responses to the sound. So your energies that are in each body actually you can clearly show, become entrained to each other. Um, how can we measure this emotional energy? What are the ways we can do it? I'll just digress very quickly. Um, how am I doing? Good. Um, uh, it's fantastic. We've got like two timers. And it's just it's fantastic. Um, does it start turning red? And, and You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, so we have the energy of the body. The nervous system is divided into peripheral and central ner um, uh, nervous systems. And um, under central nervous system, we all know is the brain, peripheral nervous system goes down into the somatic, the things that fire the muscles um, and movement of the body, and the autonomic, those things that are not in your control, that um, instill our energy of the body, all of these things like um, heart rate variation, um, galvanic skin response, breathing. Um, so how do we harvest this energy from the body? We've talked about how we harvest power from the body, but how do we harvest this communication? Um, well, you can do the far left, which makes an interesting um, one-of-kind piece, but uh, really hard to take <coughs> on the road. Um, and uh, then, so this is sort of the movement of the technology. The one on the bottom is a system that um, we designed just about a year ago, um, that uh, actually almost two years now. Uh, this just measures the electrical signal from the brain um, and amplifies that and sends it um, to the computer. Uh, again, we could power that. It's not pure energy. It's not big enough 
to actually just power electronics just from the EEG. We have to supply power um, with amplification, and we can do that through some of the other sources we talked about. Um, to measure, that would be how we could actually get the central nervous system, the thought processes, those things that are involved in um, cognition and emotion. Um, we, nervous system of the body, we can measure EMG, and I'm not really sure that this is gonna be a demo that, um, that I can do, that anybody can see. So what I think we'll do, I just did this ridiculous, and I, I tried to make it as, um, <coughs> as a, a secondary school, um, junior high school level as I can. So we have a bunch of LEDs that's, that are powered from um, the electrical signals from the muscles. So afterwards, what we'll do is we'll just um, fire it up, and you can come up and see the LEDs blinking. If you want to see it in performance, I think Atau actually already showed um, compositionally. But it's just interesting. I thought, um, I mean, this sits autonomous from the computer. It's just a separate device. And matter of fact, it's powered by a little battery. And if we get um, Jamie's solar cells working, um, or the windmill working outside, and we can actually um, power that from that. Or you're, you get the shoes going. Um, the electrooculogram is actually signals that come from the eyes. So every part of the body has to have some driving energy associated with it. Otherwise, it's not going to move. It's going to sit there and do nothing. And so even your eyes, um, as they move left and right, have energy associated with them. And your eyes are actually one of the few signals in your body that's just like this battery. When you look left, the battery goes left. When you look right, the battery goes to the right. All you have to do is measure the potential across your head, um, and you can see the energy going left and right. And this is used commonly um, in American debates to try to see how often you blink and how often your eyes dart back and forth. Um, George Bush tends to blink an awful lot, um, and this purportedly rather shifty head as well. Um, other things that we can do to measure the um, um, autonomic nervous system. This is the, again, we, we started with the um, what's happening in the brain, then we're going to what's happening in your gestures and your physical motion, and then what's happening in those things that <coughs> underlie all of your emotional states, the autonomic nervous system. Some of the things you can measure are respiration, skin temperature, um, the oxygenation of your blood, um, and your blood pressure. All of these actually can be used in performance and for um, uh, for interacting with the, the, y between you and the environment and, and are being used quite now. Um, and then probably the one that's near and dear to, um, to Stein's heart um, is measuring the um, electrodermal activity. And this was <coughs> first used um, here with the, the crackle bottle. It's probably been talked about before this week, yeah? Um, um, if you don't have a crackle box, they're still selling them? Yeah, yeah. you can still buy them. They're made out of wood, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, again, here is something that measures um, the, the electrodermal activity of your, of your hands is very anthropologically related to um, where we came from. Um, when you have the fight or flight reaction, um, you used to, a long time ago, your ancestors used to climb trees. And so what happened, had to happen is your hands and your feet had to become sticky. Um, and so they do now. And um, they still do. And unfortunately, polygraph examiners love that fact. So um, it re it's a re one of the very revealing things about what happens um, inside your inside your thought process and emotion reveal <coughs> revealed through this change in conductivity of your skin. That's all showing these uh, skin pores don't open and close on their own. They have to have energy. So again, it's this change um, of energy state. And what um, uh, uh, the crackle box does is measure this change of energy, and it has to supply a little bit of voltage to you just to um, watch that energy change happen. But again, I'm sure we could get a, um, a crackle box with an accelerometer in it so you can power it um, while, you're, while you're shaking it as well. Um, and just, just so that you don't ever get confused, um, uh, I've seen some exhibits, uh, both installations and pieces that use um, impedance of other parts of your body. Um, those actually don't react to your emotional state. They react to um, how much activity you have, how much you sweat, and also your body weight, um, but they don't react to anything else. So if you're interested in your change in emotional state and things like that, you need to stick to the, the, the surface of your hands and the bottoms of your feet. It's a different kind of skin. Um, so that's why the crackle box doesn't work on your belly. Um, it just really works on your hands. Um, and I guess that's why he made the digits, right? So you can put your toes on there. And, um, <laughs> and, and the last one we all know about is the ECG signal. And um, again, 
the ECG signal is a physical activity but manifested in this change in energy um, surrounding your heart and it's actually the largest electrical signal that flows through your body. Um, you could almost, almost get to the point where you could power things from it um, just from the electrical signal but it's just not quite there um, because it has to go through your skin otherwise you could. Um, so. Uh, how, do, how do you use this energy, this communications of energy, this uh, movement of energy um, in pieces? Um, well, the first, one of the first works we were um, doing was, or first things we were interested in is what happens to you guys as you're listening. Um, I'm conveying this information to you. You are in various um, uh, different states of wondering where your car keys are and um, blogging and <coughs> doing all of those kinds of things. And, but. Do the, and from that, your body's electrical energy state changes. You, your cognitive, pro, all the things we just talked about, your cognitive changes, your um, somatic nervous system, your um, uh, autonomic nervous system all changes. So can we use that in performance? The answer is yes. We actually, um, and I'll talk about a piece in a bit, but we put together these, uh, what we affectionately term as electric chairs or chairs of death. Um, they have little sensors in the arms, um, and what they do is as you lay your hand on it, they're crackle boxes. They measure the impedance of your skin. They also measure the changes in heart rate um, as you're sitting on that. And it's fascinating to know what happens, watch what happens. For example, I just stood up just now. And if I were measuring all of you, we would see this wave propagate because a few of you actually looked up um, as I stood up. It's like, oh, something's happening. Um, and then, you know, and then it would, be, and, and now there would be this movement of, of a little bit of, um, of giggling and joy, and you would see that moving through the audience. So here's this communication of energy that moves throughout the audience in a very sympathetic way. And by the way, the word here is emotional contagion. Um, so we can measure this, this in the audience. Um, and uh, just a fascinating anecdote about this is that um, I am, grew up in a really rural part of the United States, and you could probably tell by my accent. Um, and electroacoustic music scares the crap out of me. Um, and so what, this is actually me sitting in a chair over here listening to electroacoustic music. Um, th this is four different people. This is Pedro Rebello. Um, uh, for those, I guess some of you know Pedro. Um, and uh, it's like, you know, oh, that crashing sound means this. And he's all cognitive and everything. And here I am going, holy crap, that was loud. <laughs> um, and so you, you can, so there's also individual differences as these things move. But if, what's interesting, though, is there are edges. If you zoom in on these things, you will see edges even in the most hyperkinetic person um, and the most relaxed person. You will see edges as they move through the audience and get conveyed. Um, and um, the other, th that was looking at the energy in an audience and then the energy in a performer. We did a, um, uh, an experiment where we actually measured the energy of um, violinists playing um, Paganini, um, which doesn't scare me. Uh, uh, sorry, Bach. Um, it, was a, it was a Paganini competition where they were playing Bach. Um, and uh, this is just the visualization of the energy that's happening. Um, and this is, by the way, a Max MSP patch for those of you that were here for David. It's David it's still here. No, OK. Because he would probably yell, this is Max 4.6 instead of 5.0. So the, the box edges aren't rounded. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to say that. I had to bring that up. Um, but what you can see here is the, um, the different signals that, that are coming from the body. You have um, uh, GSR, you have um, EMG. We, we did um, left and right arm and left leg. Um, we uh, did ECG and um, even alpha and beta activity of the brain. So here we were looking at all of these different um, sources of energy in the body. And it was not bad. I mean, in terms of energy conservation and our size of coal, that is the battery right there. Um, it was a little 9-volt battery that was running the transmission, although there were PCs on the other end that were sucking the um, grid dry. Um, but in terms of using that as a way of interacting, it, in fact, you could probably harvest the energy from the body to do that. Um, so. How do I um, do this without seeing what I'm doing? First, we're going to pull that, and then do that. Um, and so finally, how do we use this in, um, in 
musical performance or uh, how can we do that? Um, take this energy that's coming from the body and, and use it in an artistic way. Oh, I have a meeting. <laughs> can, Robin, can you um, text Nick and tell him I won't be making the meeting? Um, uh, the, this is something that's near and dear to my heart because I'm interested in, um, in moving between these dimensions and this is what I began when I was talking about it, um, a Tao's piece and, and other pieces that we've done, that I've done. Um, I'm interested in moving between pieces that use the energy from the body in a direct physical connection between the instrument, the traditional quote unquote way where the instrument is powered by your energy. Um, and introducing this, pa this pathway here where you can go directly between emotion and thought, bypass the physical interface, and go straight to creating sound itself. Can we measure, and as we've shown, we can, um, these electrical signals from the body and use those directly for sound generation. And so can we move between the traditional physical interface layer? Can we augment that with other energy paths? Can we even remove the physical layer entirely and remotely control an instrument from a distance, very much like what um, uh, Michelle did? And then finally, can we move, go to this layer where, in, in fact, you have to make no physical gestures, no energy consumed in, in movement, all the energy consumed in just simply changing thought and, and emotional state. And so the other is to, you can do the same thing with the audience, which is, can we directly take, I have feedback from you, I can see heads that are dropping, um, people looking at their watch, <coughs> things like that. Um, I can perceive that, but also can I actually measure that and use that directly, that energy, bring it back and use it directly in the piece itself. Um, so just finishing how, how I've used that in, in a couple pieces, one that we did um, last summer where um, it's called The Reluctant Shaman. And here's a piece, um, and this is what I was mentioning at the beginning. Uh, this is a piece where I had a, um, an uh, actor in his 60s um, who was actually a, a very accomplished traditional Irish musician. And the piece was about his exploration of an ancient Irish site. And all of the audience members were wearing uh, earphones as well as listening to live mo music. And what, in their earphones, what they heard was they heard him breathing. They heard his heart beating. They heard him walking through what, what was the Irish sacred site. So the, that shoe that you saw earlier, we, they actually heard his footsteps. So you can harvest the energy, but as I said, you can also use that as part of the composition. So you heard him walking in your ears. You heard everything that he would hear as he's walking through an ancient Irish site. And what you saw live was actually his imagination. Um, so you actually, um, the, there were real traditional Irish musicians playing um, live, and that was what he was imagining, the music of that site before he was ever there. So we, all of these electrical signals from the body that you, in fact, self-monitor. Matter of fact, there are two schools of thought between emotion and energy. Um, there's one school of thought that says that your body has these um, uh, response feelings and then your emotion reacts to that. And then some people believe that your electrical signals react to your um, cognitive and emotional state. And obviously there's a, there's a little of both. And so the audience was directly hearing this. At the same time, all of these chairs were chairs of death, so all of the audience members were sitting and being monitored, and their view on his imagination was being modulated by their, their energy state. So they, were, they had their hands um, on these chairs, and as their emotional state changed, the lighting, both amplitude and color, changed, this giant mood ring, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that allowed their, the, the view of what was actually <coughs> happening live. So here we were using all of these different sources of energy, his kinematic energy, his motion, his um, emotional energy, his physiological energy, and the audience's energy as well, and combining them um, into a piece. And then to finish up, last slide, I promise. Um, uh, this is a piece that was actually, this is a pitch first time. Um, this, was, this is a piece that um, Eric uh, Lyon and I started working on here. When was that? Um, sometime this summer. And uh, we're, we're continuing to work on it, and hopefully we'll finish up in the next month or so. Um, it's very strange chamber music piece um, where, in fact, uh, we have violinists. So in, in the context of this talk, somebody that's converting um, uh, physical energy into sound directly. We have 
the power hog um, using the laptop and um, uh, basically it's also physical energy, his, his changing of um, keyboard and mouse movements. And then I will be um, doing physical motion as well as um, uh, doing emotional change. And the, the, so the composition is designed to elicit emotional changes in me, which then change the composition. So here's this, this movement between um, composer and physical sound created by the violinists over to me, my emotional reactions measured electrically and then passed back and forth between each other. So um, in summary, really, the, the, what we can get off of the body are really two things. One is um, the power harvesting, ways of supplying a coal fire plant from the body. And the second is a communication channel using the, these changing electrical signals that happen within the body, and they overlap almost entirely. Thank you, Ben. Do we have any questions for Ben? While we're segueing. Um, well, thanks. We'll, we'll have a discussion at the end as well, of course. So save questions if you think of them. Um, next, we're going to hear from Brian Dagger. So we should swap all this stuff. Yeah. Should we just swap places? places. Yeah, that could do. Um, yeah. 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 So Brian um, is someone that I've, that I've invited over from. He's based in Newcastle now, where I'm based, and in the UK. And he's got a background in biotechnology and um, has done some work with some performance groups, uh, Blast Theory, a few other people in the UK, and is presently looking at what people's access to technology, artists' access to technology and models for that as a kind of resource, um, as well as some interesting hardware projects and, and the like. So I'm sure you'll talk about once he's set up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we're just <laughs> rearranging the universe here. No, no, no. So let's welcome Brian. Hi, um, yeah, as, it, as Jamie said, I'm Brian. Um, so I'm coming at, at uh, I guess, new media and music and composition from a, a completely different direction. Um, my background is in biotechnology, and this has kind of given me, I guess, an access to a, an appreciation of technical knowledge. So when I'm thinking about making artwork, I'm thinking about how can I translate um, recent research in science or um, or like discoveries into something that that is an art piece. So, but as well as this kind of interest in making artworks around te technology, I'm also interested in how how artists or um, musicians actually access the technology they're interested in. Like this this cutting edge technology, like Ben's talking about. Um, and how like uh, groups of peers can actually start to set up networks to to um, exchange this information. Um, I think with the open source movement, there's, there's the bar is now lowered significantly with some of the the new technologies, and this is allowing uh, new fields of working for artists and researcher. So, leading on from Ben. So we can think about energy as uh, the transduced message or information. So this has like a definite crossover with mapping. Um, I'm also trying to address or well, think about what artworks um, kind of have an environmental message without being something that's preaching or you know something that helps us understand what we're doing. So. I think to, to, in order to do this, we have to accept that currently human ecology is the main ecology in the world, and that conservation is almost a limited concept of how to move forward. If we try and conserve what we have, I don't think we're actually going to go anywhere. So this idea of sustainability is also this um, strange concept where 
We know everything is basically unsustainable. We just have to make it work for us. So energy music is sort of getting off the grid and getting over the, the embarrassment of being environmental. <laughs> so I'm talking, so yeah, I'll mention some works. So um, last year in, in Prague, I heard something about bioacoustic ecology. And originally I was thinking it's acoustic ecology, but not coming from a, a composition background, I didn't realise that acoustic ecology was already kind of, kind of, fenced off. But um, this interesting idea of that like scientists have kind of been looking at, uh, you know, when they're looking at insects, they're always thinking, oh, insects communicate using smell, pheromones, these kind of things. Um, but actually, uh, for some reason, yeah, there's, but actually they're also sound producing and sound transducing uh, 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 organisms. So, for example, there's a boring beetle that's currently part of a major deforestation in America, and it uses its sound detection um, apparatus to kind of detect these events in um, trees called cavitation events. And this is related to um, the, the circulation of the tree. And then when, because it's a, a passive, it's a capillary action, it's a passive uh, kind of transfer of, of um, the flow of, when, it, when trees are stressed, they have breakages in, in this kind of capillary action, and this actually generates sounds that can be detected by insects. And not only do these insects detect these sounds as kind of a, um, that there's a, these trees stressed and therefore a little bit more vulnerable to the insect, but once the insect, the borer, actually gets into the tree, then it will start to send out its own signal saying, come here, food's here. So, I guess this is no new concept that sonification seems to be the poor brother of visualization. But is that is that a true concept for for people here, or that it's a <laughs> yeah yeah controversy? Not these people. No 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 I know, but in the general kind of. I guess hierarchies, I don't know. <laughs> so, but there's a number of pieces that, that involve kind of the, the transduction of of, uh, of sound over distance in this one by Katie Patterson, The Sound Dog, which is actually a, a telephone in an in a installation attached to a, a glacier in um, in Iceland. So you ring you ring the glacier and you can kind of hear it. And one of her other pieces is Earth, Moon, Sun, which is where she translated the Moonite Sonata into Morse code and then, I guess, used, uh, translated that into a, a visual kind of laser pulse and kind of got the reflection back from it. And because of the, um, the, the, the shadows in the moon, this actually subtly transformed the Moonlight Sonata, which then, in the installation, actually played on a pianola. So there are also like artists that are actually really interested about getting off the grid. And like for example, Marco Pelliam's Macro Lab. This is sort of like a self-sustained art station that he's kind of him and his collaborators have placed in a lot of different fragile environments. Like so kind of trying to get the artist into Antarctica on their own steam rather than as part of a wider research scientific research um, focus. He, him and his group are also interested in, in generating infrastructure for their own kind of thing. So for example, they're thinking of making their own satellite and putting that into orbit so that they can start to set up their own communication infrastructure. Okay. So thinking about energy mapping and how that kind of gives us a bit of information about what's happening. Um, there's this, seems in, in artworks, there seems to be either this kind of quite loud, shouty, you know, environmentalism around activism and preaching. And then there's also like artworks that are much quieter. 
the aid is there, but it's and it is informative, but it doesn't have to be about preaching this. So one example of this was is the Milk Project by Esther Pollock and Leva Ozina. And this is actually kind of a, a visualization of of milk uh, cheese production in in um, that's produced though the milk is produced in Latvia and then how that, that milk gets across the, the many many boundaries and how it's transformed. And um, when she talked about it, she was of the the, the, um, the opinion that this was an actually an environmental piece. Um, but in this panel, there was also people that were kind of like, no, artists can actually shout about environmentalism. And that's maybe, that was one position. And now I'm coming back to this idea that no, you can have quite gentle ways of thinking about how the ecology works. Another one that's a very nice visualisation is by a group called Hihi. And they're actually um, using, using a laser and uh, probably a max patch, kind of trying to... <laughs> probably, or PD, I don't know. Um, they were trying to make visible the, the, the energy consumption in, in um, various locations. So, for example, this picture is in Helsinki, and it's actually um, a laser that's on the, the smokestack coming out of the coal station. So people could kind of do things in the, envir in the, in the community to kind of make that, that circle smaller. Um, another piece that I really enjoy is a piece called The Lake by Julie Freeman. Um, this is, on a number of different levels, this is really interesting when we're thinking about sound energy. Um, it's a visualisation of freshwater fish um, and how they aggregate and, and how they're visualised. But the fish are actually being detected by a, a, a acoustic sensors that are placed in them. And so it's... Yeah. <laughs> So it's, the information is coming from, from the fact that sound is being transduced and then it's being changed again into like these visuals. Now she actually tried thinking about having fish-like shapes and actually people weren't so interested in having fish-like shapes. So he's actually really interested in having abstract shapes that showed, you know, how like, I guess, carp, perch, how they aggregated. So over time you could kind of see where they were in this small pond, and her actual installation was in a water tower, so you were actually looking up like you were underneath the the, um, the lake. Uh, so, is there an end to innocence, an end of the aesthetic that you know now it's time that artists must react? And out of energy and duration constraints, can we produce long-term self-powered art? So, thinking about the sort of the status quo of, of like this environmentalism that it's actually, you know, generally high tech. You know, it's like the, the government will solve it for you. But there's, there seems to be a lot of knowledge that that's sort of ha uh, that's quite high embedded, but it's actually embedded in low technology solutions. Um, I think the time is to sort of take a little bit more autonomy in, in making, uh, making choices. So, like for example, Heath Bunting has, is uh, an artist in the UK and he's doing various mapping, mapping um, projects. One of them is sort of how you can, by going through many of these card, store cards, how you can gradually make yourself a, an, an artificial identity. And just by showing how this is, you know, I guess uh, can be used for good or evil. <laughs> but um, I guess he's thinking about, you know, this notion of, of boundaries between places are actually uh, porous to some people and actually very opaque to other people. 
So recently there was also the end of the Viridian design movement. And he had the, the guy that did that has a really nice quote about sustainability. That sustainable practices navigate successfully through time and space while others crack up and vanish. So basically the sustainable is about time, time and space. So you re need to rethink your relationship to material possessions in terms of things that occupy your time, the things that you are physically close to you, time and space. So coming back to Jamie's kind of anti-cool, or you know, it's it's cool. Oh, it's not cool to care. Um, it's another uh, work by He He that's sort of a, a a light that responds to smoke. So it's sort of kind of I think it was just before the band came in. The the generalized. So actually, it required you to smoke in order to like activate this artwork. <laughs> So back to um, thinking about how to transfer this information and how to be a bit, I guess, not negative about the future. <laughs> and I've been part of a, a kind of, I guess, a forum or a series of events called Luminous Green. And this is done by um, a group called Foam that's based in Brussels and uh, in, in Amsterdam. So these are sort of gatherings to allow networking. But it's sort of, it's about the world that supports life today and about possible worlds that can support more luminous life in the future. So with the main thing is like you have you have like a dull grey future where we just, you know, consume less and less and less. And this is sort of against that kind of idea. Like an idea of a luminous green future where we use what we know in order to make it a better place or, you know, in order to just be a bit more efficient, but in a way of making us happier at the same time. So, so but with the, the thing with Luminous Green is that you can only have these meetings every now and again. And I'm, so I'm kind of thinking about how to um, use the technology we have to set up peer networks between peers.